Using data assets in PCG is awesome. It allows you to customize many different things and allows you to easily swap out the data assets for different designs and different variations in your PCG graph to give you a lot of control. But did you know you can also use data tables? Well, in this tutorial, I'm gonna be showing you how to create data tables and use them with PCG. And there's actually something very unique about data tables that makes them very interesting to use with PCG. And I'll show you just what that is. So let's get started. First thing we're gonna do is go to edit plugins and make sure PCG is turned on by turning on procedural content generation framework, PCG, and restarting your engine as needed. After that, we'll get started with creating the data table. Now for that, we're gonna need a few things, starting with a struct. So I'm gonna right click, go to blueprint structure. This one right here. I'm gonna call it S underscore for structure underscore shapes. And then I'm gonna open it up. By default, yours will look something like this. With structure on the left, default values on the right as tab. But what I like to do is take the default values and drag it to the right side. So I immediately see the variable I set on the left and its default value on the right. So what do we wanna do here? Well, I want this to be like a data asset where I wanna offset the position and I wanna randomize the rotation and maybe even randomize the scale. That's some basic stuff. You could of course customize it to your heart's content, but these are the basic ones I'm gonna show you how to set up. So this first one I'm just gonna rename to min offset. I'm gonna change the Boolean to a vector. You can see the default values automatically turn to zeros here, which is great. And then I'll add another variable and you'll reuse the same variable type as you had before. And this will be max offset. Then I'll add another variable this time setting it to be a rotator and there's going to be min rotation another one called max rotation and then we'll do the same thing for scale we'll add another variable this one's going to go back to vector it's going to be min scale and last one max scale also vector now i'm going to change the min and max scale values here min i'm going to set to one in all axes and max i'm going to set to one in all axes because i don't want it by default scaling at all just like i don't want it to be offset by default and i don't want it rotating by default so this is good this is kind of what I want. So it's great that we have the min, max, and scale. There's one thing I want to add to all this. Well, it's a static mesh. What is the mesh that we'll actually be setting up here? So I'm gonna change the variable here to static mesh, and we want the regular static mesh object reference, and I'll rename it to mesh for our actual input. And you know what? I'll actually move it all the way to the top. So we have access to a mesh right at the beginning. Fantastic. Now we're gonna need the data table for it. So I'm gonna right click, go to miscellaneous, data table right over here. And we need to select the S underscore shapes from the job down. Thankfully we can search so we can just find it really quickly, hit okay. And now we have the data table that I'm gonna call DT underscore shapes and open it up. This right here is a data table if you have never seen it. You can see it says row name, mesh, min offset, max offset, min rotation, max rotation, min scale, and max scale. Because these are the variables we set up. And you can always tell what the data table is based off of over here on the top right. The row type is S underscore shapes. So you always know what it is made up of. And if you ever want to add another row, we can always go back to S shapes and modify it. And here we can start adding things. For example, let's add a new row. And you can see it starts automatically populating everything. We also get the information down below here. So the first thing I'm going to change is the row name. Let's call it cube. That's going to be the row name. The mesh, I can go ahead and just select a random cube here. It's got a nice basic one. You can see it automatically populates the paths. The offset, I'm going to tell it, you know what, cubes, they can go from the ground level up 500 units. They can go up and down. And you know what? They can also rotate 360 degrees, and I want them to be able to scale up to 2x in XYZ. So you can see here, all the information has been populated that we just put in here. And now we can add another one by adding the add again. And here we can say, let's say cylinder. And here I can go ahead and select a cylinder. For this one, I'll tell it, it can actually be offset, let's say in X and Y, but we don't want it to move up or down. And we want it to rotate negative 90 to 90 in X and Y, but not rotate in Z. And we'll keep it the same. And lastly, I'll add one more. This can be our spheres. And this one will just scale between 0.2 and 0.5. So that's our data table. We can, of course, add as many as we want here, but this is going to be good enough for now. Go ahead and save. So now let's go ahead and get started with the PCG graph. We're going to right click, go to PCG, PCG graph, and it's going to be our PCG underscore random shapes. And we'll open it up. To make it easier for ourselves, I'm just going to use a create points grid node. I'm going to change the grid extents to 2000 and 2000 in the X and Y. And I'll change the cell size to be 200 by 200 in the X and Y. The Z I will leave alone. And I'll also adjust the steepness here to 1.0. Based on the description, PCG point represents a discretized volumetric region of world space. The point steepness value zero to 1.0 establish how hard or soft the volume will be represented. From zero, it'll ramp up literally increasing its influence over the density 
from the point center up to two times the bounds. At one, it will represent a binary box function with the size of the point's bounds. We want it to be exactly the size of the bounds, so we're going to set it to one. And I'm also going to change the coordinate space to be local component instead of global. The rest we can leave as is. Now, if I grab the PCG graph and I drag it out, if I sample the point node, the create points grid, you can see here's our points. Now, it's all white because, well, it's perfectly dense, but that's okay. The main thing is if we press A and we go and select it in the bottom left corner here, you can see here's our all our points. We have 400 total. So now these points are just regular points. They have the steepness, the color, the bounds, all the information, but they don't have the stuff from the data table. So let's go ahead and add that. To do that, we'll just right click and search for data table. And there's a nifty note called load data table. And you can see the detail panel. It takes a data table input as an output type of point. You can also do attribute set, which in our case is all we need. We don't need it to create the points. The attribute set will be fine. And now it's going to get just the attributes from the data table. Now, I don't want to hard code it here. So instead, I'm going to open up the load data table. You can see we have data table as an input, which means I can deselect it, add a new parameter. We could change the type of the parameter to be a data table. And we want it to be an object reference data table. And I'll go ahead and rename it to shape data table. And I'm going to select the data table right in here, just like so. So I'm going to right click, search for get shape data table, and that is going to go into our data table input here. And now we have our data table. Now, if I press A on this data table, you can see here we have our mesh, our min offsets my in X, Y, Z, max offsets in X, Y, Z, the rotations, the minimal and the maximums, and the scales, the minimums and the maximums. So we have all the information here. So not to randomly assign them to these points, I can just drag out of here. I search for match and set attributes. The match data is going to go from this data table. And we can already preview this. If I drag out and search for a static mesh spawner, we need to change the mesh selector type to be by attribute here, the first one, and the attribute name will be mesh. And all of a sudden, you can see here, there's our spheres, there's our cubes, there's our cylinders all in here. But of course, it doesn't have any of the transforms or anything else from the data table. So we need to pipe those in as well. To do that, we'll create a new PCG graph that will work as our loop. Right click PCG, PCG graph. I'll call it PCG loop apply transforms. Now I'll go ahead and take it and drag it right into our main graph and select loop node, the bottom option here for creating a loop node. Then I can double click on it to open it up. So this is going to be a very basic loop. On the input here, I'm going to open it. I'm going to change the input to be a loop type and the allowed types will be point. And I'm going to set the pin status to be required. For the output is going to allow only points and I'm going to set it to be normal pin status. So all we need to do here is drag out of the input and search for a transform points node and the output is going to go into the output. I'll open up the transform points. And in here, if you wanted to, you could specify non-uniform scale. If you're setting this up for yourself, you could absolutely create a new pool inside of the data table that allows you to set uniform or non-uniform scale. I'll leave it to be uniform in my case for this demonstration. So this will be just fine. But from the input, I'll need to drag out and search for get attribute from point index on this guy right here. And the attributes we want to grab are these ones right here. The min offset, max offset, min rotation, min scale, all of these right here we need to grab. So we do that one at a time. For the input source, I'm going to specify min offset, and that's going to go to offset min. Then I'll go ahead and duplicate it, switch the next one to max offset, put it into max, and do the same similar thing for the rest. So in the end, you'll have something like this. An input that gets the attribute from all of the things and plugs them into the offsets, rotations, and scales accordingly. So now how do we use this? Well, first we want to filter by the meshes. I'm going to first detach the static mesh spawner. And after the mesh and set attributes, I'm going to use an attribute partition. And in the detail panel, I'm going to change the partition attribute selector index zero from last to be mesh. Because I want to split it up by the static mesh that we have specified. You can absolutely split it up by anything else you have, if you're example, added attributes that say hey, this one is blue, this one's red, you have a variable for that, you could split it up by that, whatever you'd like for the future. It's just a matter of what you're trying to control. In my case, I'm doing it per mesh, so this is perfect. And now that we have this, we can plug that into our loop here, and the loop can go into the static mesh spawner. And just like that, you can see there's our cubes all up higher. Our spheres are considerably smaller and our cylinders are rotated. So this seems to be working pretty well. Now, a couple of things here. If I want to make changes to this, you might think all we need to do is go into our 
DG shapes, go to sphere, and let's say I want, I'm fine with the spheres being as big as they are. In fact, I want them bigger from 0.7 to even 1.2. Let's say this is the new scale that I want, and I look back at what I had. Well, nothing has changed. Why has nothing changed? Well, this is important. It doesn't automatically update until you hit save. Save here is very important. Once you hit save, you look at that. The spheres are now big as they were supposed to be when I changed it. So make sure you save your data table if you want to actually update. This does save you from accidentally changing a value, having it recalculate and having it potentially having a longer calculation where you don't need to. You control when it actually updates effectively. But looking at this now, we have a lot of overlapping things. So we want to fix that. So let us go ahead and prune some stuff that are overlapping. In our original PCG graph here, I'm going to use a new 5.5 node right before the static mesh spawner. And this is going to be bounds from mesh. And it's going to take the bounds from the meshes and apply them as the bounds. So if I change the mesh attribute from last to mesh, the warning will go away and it's happy. If I go ahead and plug this in so you can see the static meshes and I sample the previous node here, you can see that the bounds of these points aren't correct relative to the point information of some of these objects, like the sphere here, that cube is inside the sphere, but it's also much bigger than this cube. It's not consistent. But if I sample the bounds from mesh node, well, you can see all the cubes are actually perfectly overlapping. And so is the cylinders. And so are the spheres. They're perfectly bounded over everything. So now that we have the new bounds for the mesh, I can drag out and search for self pruning and I can leave the defaults from large to small. I want to prioritize the large ones. I can also prioritize the small ones, but large is fine. And that then goes into the static mesh spawner as before. And now, as you can see, well, things are overlapping a whole lot less. Now, there's still some overlapping, as you can see right over here. For some reason, it is not doing a perfect job actually pruning these. They occasionally will overlap a bit. So what I find works pretty well is after the bounds from mesh, I'm just going to throw in a simple bounds modifier right here, right before the self pruning node. And I'll set the bounds modifier scale here to something like 1.2 in all axes. And then we'll have the self pruning and then the static mesh spawner. And that kind of helps fix up some of the issues. But effectively, we now have something that is resembles a data asset, but just in a data table form. So we can now go in here and add new things if we want to, right? We can add a pyramid here, by adding a new row name pyramid, selecting the pyramid shape, let's say having it rotate 360 degrees up to 3x scale, hitting save. And now we have the pyramids. I've been thinking, well, that's cool, but what's special about data tables otherwise? Because I'm happy with data assets. Well, data tables are effectively CSV files, which means anything that can get you data on the internet can be made into a data table, which can be then used to generate with. And you might be thinking now, well, what can generate data? Something like ChatGPT? That's right. We can have ChatGPT give us data that we can then convert into points to spawn different PCG graphs. Over here is a very basic structure. It just has X, Y, Z. All of them are floats. They're not even vectors. Super basic. And all I've done is basically I've cared only about the positioning information. So now what I could go ahead and do is go to ChatGPT and say, hey, generate me a data table where the first column just is the index of the point because that is our row name. And then the next three values are the X, Y, and Z positions that I'll just reassemble myself, honestly, inside a PCG. I can absolutely tell it to automatically create a vector. It'll just need to be formatted the correct way, but to make it really easy on ChatGPT so there's no extra errors, I just say X, Y, Z, good enough, I'll do the rest. Because if you have the free version, you can only generate a certain amount of CSVs at a single day. So that's why I don't want to risk mistakes to the simple version. And that's what it'll do. It'll generate a CSV and here is a CSV. Here it is. And it just has the point information here, as you can see. And the values are very small and I could have told it to increase the values by a certain amount. But honestly, again, this is fine to work with. For the chat GPT version, all I've done is take the load data table and used a few set attributes with the inputs being position X, the input goes to X, and then I have position Y with the second input being the Y attribute and same thing with Z. And then in my case, I'm just transforming them to be really small points because it's moving them very little so I can see them. And then I'm just copying them to the original location. So that way it just becomes a local location and I'm spawning just a simple cube here. And so what I get now is if I drag it out and we take a look, well, there you go. I now have a wave generated by a data table. 
that I got from ChatGPT. Now, this isn't very interesting. What I can do is swap the data table for this one to another one that I generated. And this right here is what it thinks a duck. Now, it's not a very good duck, let's be honest here, but it's definitely interesting and definitely could be useful for some things. But really, what about a 3D fish, right? Again, the point of this is that it is using a data table where you're just getting data from somewhere. It doesn't have to be from ChatGPT. It could be from Houdini. It could be from a scan that you've done. It could be from anything else. You just need the position information and you convert the position information vectors into points from anywhere. You can see now we have a fish. So while you can absolutely use it as a simple data asset version, just another way of storing your information. You can also use it for things like this, where you can take information from somewhere else, bring it into a data table and use it that way. Now, if you want to know how to do that, I will show you that real quick. If you have any data table, let's say the one we created, we can right click on it and just export it as CSV. And then you can see how it's actually formatted to make sure that whatever you bring into it formats it the same way, just like you want it. And you can also drag in CSVs and it'll ask you, to specify the data table row type here, or I can specify S shapes, for example, or in my case, I know it's ChatGPT structure. So I'll go ahead and select that, hit apply. And now if I open it, you can see there is our row name and our XYZ, just like it wanted when it brought those in. So it is very easy to bring data out of Unreal and into Unreal, which is a very big bonus. But hopefully this gives you some kind of ideas on where you could possibly use data tables. Again, it is not one of those things that's gonna completely revolutionize everything, but for certain things, it might be just what you need. And if you're gonna be using data tables, let me know in the comments below what you're gonna be using them for. I'd love to hear it. And if you'd like to play with this for yourself, the project will be available on my Patreon where you can join these wonderful people here and supporting what I do. It really means a lot. And the link to the Discord will be down below if you'd like to join our community as always. And if you haven't heard of data assets yet and you haven't been using them in your BCG project, check out this video right over here to learn just how they work and get started using them.